or to make our current practice more robust. Let's listen. Dr. Sleeth, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to stop by today. I just finished reading your book 24-6 a few days ago, and I can't tell you how much I really enjoyed it and how much it made me start thinking about my own life and how to incorporate Sabbath um, a little bit more into that. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Well, thanks for having me. It's a delight to be with you and your listeners. Oh, thank you. Um, Before we get started talking about your book, I want to know a little bit about you, because I know you were an ER doctor. How did you go from that um, to being the co-founder of Blessed Earth? Well, uh, uh, the the short answer is uh, I found the Lord. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, uh, I had not been a person of faith, and no one in, in my family was. My wife, my children, uh, we we just lived as a uh, little heathen, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and um, that all changed uh, when I picked up a Bible and read it. And I picked it up in a in a time where things were kind of kind of rough going in our life in our family. My wife's uh, brother had drowned in front of my children and a number of bad things that kind of happened. And when I read uh, the Bible, and and by the way, um, this is an example of provenient grace. If anybody wants the definition of provenient grace, um, but the Bible is a big thing. And if you've never read it before and you pick it up, where do you begin? Uh, mm-hmm. My parents named me Matthew, and that's where I started. If they had named me numbers, we wouldn't be talking today. So, <laughs> um, but I, I, I met the Lord, and uh, nothing has been the same since. And it's uh, just our family has been incredibly blessed that we're all on the same page and we're all in, in uh, various jobs serving the Lord. That's awesome. How did, okay, so I want to talk about your book, 24-6, which is all about the Sabbath. So if you could, would you tell us, give us just a little overview of your book? It's it's about the Sabbath, and, and I really um, think of the book as an invitation. Sometimes uh, people talk about the Sabbath or uh, have had an experience with the Sabbath where uh, they think of it as a must-do or another thing to check off that you've done. Uh, but I really view it as an invitation into this wonderful rhythm that is really woven into the fabric of the universe. When when God made the universe in those six days, on the seventh day, he rested and he made Sabbath. And um, and that 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 rhythm is 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 woven into the fab- very fabric of creation and it's been my experience that when we enter into that um sabbath in, in a spirit of joy and thankfulness um that it becomes one of the very things we look forward to most it's just a lovely aspect of life and uh, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's an invitation uh, a lot of people you know we live in a 24 7 world There are things coming at us uh, um, all throughout the day and night. I mean, we could buy a car at three in the morning. (laughs) You can can take classes or do tests uh, any time of day or night. And and in that kind of situation, having a one 24-hour period set aside for rest, for refreshment, for worship, and and for God... um, it's just kind of a blessing I found. Mm-hmm. How did the practice of Sabbath first become important to you? My wife and children and I didn't uh, have any faith or anything. Um, and when I first read the Bible, now I'm the only one in the family who is believing in, in God. My wife was raised as a Jew and the practice of stopping one day out of seven was something that wasn't intimidating to her. That was familiar territory for her. And so we began to, um, you know, have that as the pattern of our family. Once we were all on the same page theologically, then we all kind of agreed why we were doing it. But Sabbath is for everybody. It, it's it's not just for believers. and. And the Sabbath commandments in the Bible 
are a, a lot of the verbiage of them aren't to the person who's actually reading it and going to practice the Sabbath. They're to the people um, around that, uh, the maidservant, the manservant. And don't we wish we all had a, a couple of those these days? <laughs> um, and, and children who might not even be able to read yet and uh, strangers in, in the land, that sort of thing. And even up into and including uh, our cattle. And so uh, a lot about the Sabbath is not just us taking it, but giving it to other people as an introduction to the Lord. Interesting. I hadn't thought about not just taking it for ourselves, but it could be a gift to other people. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, there's no, um, there's no uh, civilization, there's no s culture around the world that has come up with Sabbath on their own. And one of the things that was always... Um, uh, most apparent as missionaries went around the world and encountered uh, various cultures for the first time is um, that they encountered the Sabbath. Um, because Christians have, uh, by and large, um, throughout the 2,000 years of their history, kept the Sabbath, uh, observing it on the Lord's Day or on Sunday. But the principle is the same because people who would meet those missionaries had sometimes never stopped. Um, in an animistic society, every day is the same. And so it's, it's, it's really um, God's gift to the world. Uh, otherwise, I think we would go all the time or else never. <laughs> you know, right. We, we're, not, we're not very good at figuring out rhythms like that that we can stick to on our, on our own. Yeah. So after you started practicing Sabbath, then why did you go on to write a book about it? Well, I saw what it did for our family. And, and I saw how the church, by and large, didn't know why they were keeping it if they were keeping it. You know, as Christians, we're freed from the law. The, um, and the Sabbath is, commandment is the longest commandment in the Ten Commandments. Um, and, and we're no longer under um, judgment by the law. And nonetheless, the law has always been a gift. It's, it's the boundaries that civilization needs in order to be civilized. And so I wanted to share my experience and my family's experience with the Sabbath as a, as a thing to know the Lord better, to know ourselves better, and um, to, in a way, separate ourselves from the rest of society for at least one day out of seven. And, and so it was, it, I say it was an invitation to people. Um, the book has, oh, I don't know how old the book is now, um, it's got to be eight years old, something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it just keeps going and being reprinted and everything. So um, as far as I know, it's the best-selling book on the Sabbath that's come out in the last decade. Uh, and so other people see it as an invitation, too. Um, I think a lot of people realize maybe their life has is, is really going too fast. Um, and uh, But they, they really don't know how to get off of that and and mm -hmm. and uh, incorporate a sabbath in in a very different context than you know it was given uh thousands of years ago mm -hmm. as people read your book they'll see as i did after i read it and then i finished it up on a this was kind of cool so i finished it up on a saturday and then sunday and we practice sabbath anyway but it just felt a little bit different that sunday i just felt like I was more intentional about resting and maybe think, you know, like things I would have done, like, oh, that won't take me very long just to be like, you know what, I can, I can wait. I want to try like really resting today. And it was, it was one of the best things I've ever done. I think that's probably one of the reasons that uh, Sabbath keepers, if you look at them in a kind of a medical scientific lens, Sabbath keepers live longer um, than non-Sabbath keepers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the longest lived cohort of people in the United States are in Loma Linda, California, which happens to be the uh, kind of central headquarters or, or one of them of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, and those folks live about a decade longer than the rest of Americans do. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's not only a, a good spiritual practice, I think it's a good 
uh, physical uh, practice yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. So we've talked about the practice of Sabbath. What What is the practice of Sabbath? Well, I think I distinguish it as not a day off, but a day with the Lord. Ah. Um, uh, you know, a day off is is great, um, but it is it is only part of the picture. Um, the I've found that when when I set that si- uh, time aside for the Lord. Um, and that doesn't mean I have to study my Bible all the time or, you know, read religious, only religious books. But when it's when it's in my mind, hey, I'm doing this with God. And by the way, one of the questions uh, your listeners may have is what day does this have to be? Yes. Good question. To me, the ideal is Sunday because. Um, that's when Christians have most often observed it uh, on what we we call the Lord's Day. Um, There are people who can't do it on that day. Um, There are people who are in medicine or the military or um, firefighters, that sort of thing, Um, pastors. uh, And I tell those folks, uh, you know, if you can't um, do it on Sunday, move it to uh, Saturday or Monday or something, try to keep it the same. But I think that God wants us to build community. And, um, you know, I, I, I got to, you know, say that here in the middle of talking about this, we're in a very unique situation as mm-hmm. a globe where um, we can't do everything we want to do. We haven't been mm-hmm. able to go uh, anywhere we want and buy something at, you know, three, four, five in the, in the morning. Coronavirus um, epidemic or pandemic uh, began, I really thought about how um, uh, this could be a time either where you look at what we don't have, or you can say this is a time um, that God is reminding us, A, that he's in charge, <laughs> um, B, that the globe spins whether we're working <laughs> at work or not, and that we can view this as a time to draw closer to God or not. But I think the one thing um, that uh, all of us are missing who are um, part of the church and part of this body of Christ is the ability to get together um, and, and, and fellowship and worship one day out of the week. Um, And we can't do that. We haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you never uh, realize what something is until you can't do it, (laughs) until Mm -hmm. it's -hmm. it's gone or missing. And I bet you there's a whole bunch of people who kind of maybe grumble, should I go to church on Sunday, who would dearly love to go right now. Uh, So Sunday, ideal day, if it needs to be another day, move it, um, would be Mm -hmm. my answer to to what day of the week is it. Yeah. Um, You said... At the start of your question, uh, your answer, you said the Sabbath is not a day off, but a day with the Lord. What does that mean? Like, what does that look like? It's it's um, it's a day where I try to sync up and be like the Lord. And I know that uh, in Scripture that after God spent uh, a, a week uh, creating uh, the universe, that he rested from all of his labors. And so it's the one day that I know that I'm doing uh, something exactly like what the Lord did, um, and, and that, that is to rest and kind of, um, and, to, and to listen for God. And, you know, God isn't in the whirlwind. He isn't in the tornadoes and the fire. He's the quiet voice that we need to listen for. Um, and so, you know, I kind of review um, the days before. Uh, one thing that I started doing early in my um, uh, Christian life um, was that uh, having come out of emergency medicine, that sort of thing, I was a bit of a cynic. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a kind of ER humor, it's called. I didn't really have um, a heart of gratitude um, that mm-hmm. I should have. And so I, I, I realized I need to work on that. Um, and and every day I would write down something that I was grateful for, you know, literally wrote it in a journal that, you know, this is what I'm grateful for today. And then on Sabbath, I'd look back at that. <clears throat> and a lot of us can't remember what we did over the, the last week. 
But to look back over a journal day after day of what you're grateful for begins to change your view going forward. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I realized that that gratitude journal really morphed into a miracle journal. Mm -hmm. And that in opening my heart in gratefulness in taking the time to jot that down in reviewing it on Sabbath, I began to see miracles. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, you can't help but wonder when you read the Bible you know, here's Jesus walking across water and healing people and feeding 5,000 and all these amazing things. Why didn't everybody come to him and say, heal me? And I think they just didn't have the heart um, that allowed them to see or hear um, the miracles that were going on right in front of them. And that's true today. And so I would say that one of the byproducts of the Sabbath and keeping it, and by the way, <clears throat> let me get this theology out there. Okay, uh, uh, please. Uh, uh, let me just throw this out there. In, in my understanding of scripture and theology, Sabbath keeping is not a condition of getting into heaven. You mm -hmm. never keep a Sabbath and you could still go to heaven. You can still be with the Lord for eternity. So Sabbath keeping, not a condition of getting into heaven. It's just the condition that heaven is in if you get there. Oh, um, mm -hmm. And and so, uh, you know, this isn't that you have to do it. But it's uh, kind of like a gift that we can gift, take yeah. if we want to. Yeah, exactly. One of the things, because I'm a doer and it sounds given your career history and just some of the things that you said, it sounds like you're a doer as well. And the statement from your book really stood out to me when you said, it took a while for me to feel as good about resting on Sabbath as coming home from a productive day working. And I was like, yes, because every day I start out and I feel like I have to earn like some just doing nothing time in the evening, reading a book or magazine on a regular day. And so the Sabbath, I'm like, every day I feel like I have to earn the right to rest, you know, so I have to check X number of things off before I get to do it. So I was curious what the tipping point for you was when resting was as worthwhile as checking things off your list. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm not sure exactly where that came. And for your listeners who maybe want to try um, a Sabbath, I'll tell you that you're not going to get it right the first time. You're not <laughs> going to get it right the 10th time. It takes a while to to learn this, and that's okay. Have a lousy Sabbath the first, you know, <laughs> dozen times or, 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 or whatever. But you will eventually realize that the God's rest is more powerful than your work. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of us go through life, I think our Christian lives, not really appreciating that. It's, it's if you will, a trust fall. <laughs> you know, those oh. things where you lean back and you, you fall into somebody's, you know, arms. And, yes, I don't like those very much at all. <laughs> yeah, and you, and you got to trust the person. You got to trust that they're there, that they're you know, strong enough to, yes. to catch you and everything. Well, this is the God of the universe who's saying, trust me, mm -hmm. um, fall back on me. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got a Bible in front of me here and I'm going to flip to uh, a, a verse that kind of gets like that, uh, gets mm -hmm. at that. Mm -hmm. The, and I say, you don't have to keep Sabbath, but God um, makes certain promises if you do. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, what do you want? You want this out of an ESV version or you want the message? You get your choice. Uh, what do you want? Uh, let's go with the message. The message. Okay. So this is in Isaiah. It's not where we traditionally think of the Sabbath talking in Exodus and Deuteronomy and that sort of thing. Uh, but this is in Isaiah, um, uh, chapter 58 and, uh, starting at about verse 13. If you watch your step on the Sabbath and don't use my holy day for personal advantage, if you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy, God's holy day as a celebration, if you honor it by refraining from business as usual, making money, running here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I'll make you feast on the inheritance of your ancestor, Jacob. Yes, 
God says so. Uh, and so uh, God always keeps his promises, and he's promised here that if we can set that time aside, that we're really going to ride high on it all. And that's been my my experience. One of the puzzlers for me as I've been talking about Sabbath for a decade or so and teaching about it is um, uh, why more Christians don't just give it a try, why they don't trust uh, God in this, and particularly business owners. Um, a couple of the most successful Christian businesses I know keep the Sabbath. They aren't mm -hmm. open uh, one day out of the week, and they've uh, absolutely uh, prospered with that. <clears throat> And so for your, your listeners who might uh, be involved in business or spouses involved in business, I would say, try, try God on this one. Um, see if he can't, uh, you know, make you ride high above it all. As you mentioned earlier, right now, we're in, as we're recording, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And so it can seem like our lives are already slower or could, you know, they are slower. We can't travel. We can't go here and there as much as we used to. And so what does Sabbath look like during a time when it can seem like there's nothing to rest from? Well, uh, for me, I, I've still been working eight hours a day. <laughs> Okay. Monday through Friday, and and uh, uh, Saturdays are kind of do the projects around the house, uh, and Sunday really still has been set aside um, uh, as a as a time for refreshment and uh, and a focus on on God, um, and and so for me the coronavirus hasn't. Uh, it's changed that I'm not traveling. It's changed that I'm not in a different church, you know, every Sunday. It's made it possible for me to have my Sabbaths on Sunday. Um, but I've still got that work and rest um, rhythm. I think everybody needs to get out and work some every day. You know, even, even if you've been laid off of your job, uh, go clean mm -hmm. up a stream. <laughs> better or something. Seriously, um, there, there's always work to be done uh, that, that improves um, uh, our world, our father's world, and, and can help our neighbor. Um, but then you don't have to do that seven days a week. So I just thought of this as we were talking, but one of the things that I heard growing up, and so I want to know what you how you feel about this statement is I was told how you spend your Saturday affects your Sunday. Do you find that there's any truth in that? Well, I, I believe that, um, uh, it, for me, uh, the Sabbath day Sunday is the crown of the week It is, is, mm -hmm. is the high, high spot for me. And, um, uh, but, particularly when the world is kind of going around as it normally does, not, not necessarily in the middle of a pandemic. Um, a Sabbath will not happen without preparation. Uh, uh, yeah. You, you really got to prepare for it. You've got to get your work done. And particularly for the parents of young children, um, this is a time to instill in them a, a, a discipline and a, a pattern of um, putting first things first. And we're told to first seek, seek the kingdom of, of God and, and, and God's righteousness and everything else will fall in place afterwards. Um, but in order to do that, we have to prepare. Even when God was teaching uh, the Hebrew people about Sabbath, and Sabbath is the first thing he taught them uh, before, before they had any of the other commandments. Um, he taught them Sabbath. He mm -hmm. he, um, and he did that uh, by teaching them pre to prepare by uh, picking up twice as much manna the day before. If they did mm -hmm. that on any other day, the manna was rotten. So we have to prepare, and that means um, it, we we have to get uh, schoolwork done. We have to get clothes cleaned and laundered. We have to go to the store, whatever, and prepare uh, for a, a day of rest or it, it won't happen. And it's my observation. And I think I've been to probably more churches than anybody I've met. I, I know there are people who've been to more, but I doubt they've been to the variety that I have. 
um, you know, mega churches, micro churches, home churches, high church, low church, uh, uh, church without instruments, churches with rock and roll bands, the, the you know, the um, entire thing. And I've seen a lot of pastors. Uh, and for the last five years, probably three quarters of the work I've done is has been with pastors. And I love pastors as a group. Um, but without question, the most effective ones are the ones that keep Sabbath. They get, mm -hmm. they get way more done. And I believe that's because they have to learn the discipline of preparation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you see this even in, in the Jewish people. The Jewish people are a very small minority of people on, on, on the planet and, and yet have you know, something like 40% of the Nobel Prizes. Um, and I think that it is because of the refreshment that comes and the discipline of um, pre preparing uh, for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I know that my, um, you know, both of my children. Oh, yes. Uh, and they, they both uh, went to Asbury's undergraduates. Um, and uh, my son uh, went to uh, University of Kentucky as a, a medical student. And um, he did. And both of my kids did spectacularly well in school. Um, Clark graduated uh, first in his class uh, from medical school as the wow. youngest med school graduate University of Kentucky had ever had. Um, and he kept a Sabbath uh, throughout undergraduate and medical school. And I believe that was his edge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's other bright kids. There's other kids that knew how to study hard. He had the one thing I don't think anyone else had and that was one day a week in which he didn't have to be a human doing he was a human being uh, so that has been my personal experience it's been my family's experience and it's been my observation that christians who sabbath are much more effective those other six days of the week now that's not a reason to sabbath um, but it is uh, it is a cause and effect i believe yeah. You mentioned families with young children. And I know when I was a child, I really did not look forward to Sunday because it felt like a lot of things that I couldn't do instead of the joy that you're talking about that comes with Sabbath and the thing that you get to do is rest. So can we talk about that for a little bit and like how we can make Sabbath more about what we can do. Than yes. Can yeah, do. absolutely. And I think for kids, um, it's vi uh, kids love routine and they love um, also um, kind of uh, little celebrations. Um, and, and so they, they like knowing what's coming up. And so um, if your, your child uh, has to make the bed six days out of the week and they should, moms, dads, <laughs> yes. Listen up here. <laughs> it's not your job past a certain point. That's their job. Um, but they don't have to do that on, on, on the Sabbath. Um, and maybe even there's certain things that um, they're allowed to do only on the Sabbath, a certain toy they're allowed to play with or, you know, whatever. Um, and if parents kind of make those routines or on Sunday, that's the day we have pancakes. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a big one I found in <laughs> Sundays and pancakes uh, go together. You can even make them in the initial of the child. Um, and they, they begin to look forward to those things rather than we got to go to church on this day. That's, you know, you got to do this. You got to do that. It's my understanding that Jews for millennia uh, have uh, had a habit of on Sunday uh, or excuse me, on their Sabbath, which would have been Saturday, of mm -hmm. giving each of their children a spoonful of honey. Um, in the ancient world, we, they didn't have refined uh, sugars. There weren't Coca-Colas and all the, they couldn't get ice cream or whatever. Honey was the sweet thing. And the reason to give them that was to look forward to it and to understand and remember the sweetness of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with kids, that's what I'd aim for. And I'd make sure that they've got something that they can be a slacker on, on, yeah. on Sundays. Yeah. We all need some, a day that we can, even as adults, that we can be like, oh, I don't have to do that today. 
Um, so why why is it significant? And you talked about this in your book. Why is it significant that the commandment regarding the Sabbath begins with the word remember? I think it's because of our propensity to forget this. Uh, more than any of the other commandments that God gives us, we we want to um, do everything our own way. And um, one of the things that I do if I'm teaching about this in a church is um, I'll read the Sabbath commandments, longest commandment, you know, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy six days. Uh, you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath uh, set aside to the Lord, your God. And, and so I'll read that whole thing. And then I'll say, you know what, we're going to keep that commandment because the commandment says, doesn't, um, it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, meaning that simply in recalling it to mind, we're beginning to do the commandment. And what I'll do is have everybody buddy up with somebody in church. I've done this in big churches. I've done it in Southland. And uh, it doesn't matter what size church you're in, you could do this. Have everybody buddy up and uh, talk with their neighbor about uh, Sundays when they were growing up. If it's a very young church, I tell people there's a premium on no hair and gray hair people um, <laughs> and, and get with them and listen. And I have everybody share their experiences of what made Sunday different than every other day of the week. What did people do on that day? And what did they not do? And I know what they're going to say. The number one memory they have is that they went to church. Mm -hmm. um, not surprising that more Christians are in, uh, or more people are in church who, you know, remember that as, as a child. They were brought up in that. Um, when we go to church, we do a bunch of things besides just go to church. There's no other day of the week that people to get together and sing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, right? <laughs> we may pray every day, but that's a day for a corporate prayer. We may read the Bible every day, but that's probably the only day that people hear it uh, read aloud by someone else. And so when we go to church, we, you know, if you unpack that, there's a lot of things that are done that don't happen any other day of the week. Uh, mm -hmm. The next most common memory is meals with family. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Do you remember that? It was that? Yes, I remember that. And my family was fortunate enough to be able to have schedules that we could eat together a lot. But it was always something special on Sunday dinner. And then we did a lot of sitting on the front porch on Sunday, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of people remember that's the day that their mom and dad were both home. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they grew up on a farm, that's the day that the farm work was uh, not the first priority. Um, and so they remember those meals. A lot of people, uh, remember taking naps Yes. on that day. And, um, interestingly, more people remember being told to take a nap. <laughs> yes. I remember I didn't have to take a nap, but I had to be quiet for a certain number of like, like an hour or so on Sunday afternoon. And then a lot of folks remember that that is a day that their family refrained from commerce. Mm, yes. um, that they didn't go shopping on that day, et cetera. Then what I do is kind of explain the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are not grouped randomly. It's very specific in how they're. Um, the first uh, three commandments, I'm the Lord your God, not to have any other gods above me. I made you, you can't make me, so no making of idols. And then uh, to call on uh, the Lord's name, uh, in reverence, which as the Bible puts it, is not to take it in vain. Those commandments are about God. They're about how we understand God. Uh, commandments 5 through 10, honor your parents, um, don't lie, cheat, steal, murder, run around, or put stuff on your credit card to keep up with your neighbors. <laughs> um, those commandments don't really have anything to do with God per se. They are about civilization, about people. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath commandment uh, is the longest commandment. And then I'll ask people, which group do you think it belongs to? Is it, a, is it about God or is it about humanity? Is it about heaven or is it about earth? Is it about eternity or is it a temporal commandment? And mm -hmm. pretty much everybody gets it. It's about both. Mm 
Yes. It's the bridge between heaven and earth. It's the bridge between God and humanity. It's the bridge um, uh, between the temporal and the eternal. And when you walk out on that bridge, God is there. Now, um, the interesting thing that I'll then point out is um, that by merely keeping the Sabbath, they really probably did all 10 commandments. And I'll walk through that because your first, your mm-hmm. first uh, memory as we went to church, you unpack that, you have the first three commandments. Remember, mm-hmm. if a commandment says thou shall not or don't do that, that's the extent of as far away as you can get to God without going over a boundary. And in Judaism focuses a lot on that. Christianity is the exact opposite. How close can we get to God? You know, we don't want to take the Lord's name in vain, but the real the real point of that commandment is to call on the Lord in reverence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, and so people remember going to church, they kept the first three commandments. The next memory they have is we had meals. Well, I can tell you as a parent and as a grandparent and as a grandparent who's separated from their children and grandchildren, first because they're missionaries and now they're home on furlough, but because of the the coronavirus, um, there's nothing that honors me more. There's nothing I'm looking forward to more than being around the meal table again mm-hmm. with my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the honoring uh, of the parents. Um, well, what about the next commandment? You know, thou shall not kill. <laughs> Physically <laughs> right. impossible to do if you're taking a nap. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. And then I'll, I'll, I'll say, okay, you know, smarty pants, Dr. Sleeth, what about, you know, uh, thou shall not commit adultery? And I'll, um, I'll say, do you remember um, when you took a nap as a kid, everybody has a memory of going to their parents' door once when they woke up and their parents' door was locked. And I've had 70-year-old people turn bright red in the face, getting it for the first time. Their parents were not committing adultery. And everybody has a laugh and everything. I said, but it's not a laugh. The Lord in his infinite wisdom knew that a marriage needed something like a day where work and going, you know, getting and spending and working were not the center of it. And I wonder how many marriage counselors, um, as they're sitting there, um, go, tell me about your Sabbath. Hmm. And um, I believe there's a direct correlation between losing the Sabbath and losing um, marriages. Mm-hmm. I have a uh, a friend who's a pastor out in Oregon. He will not marry people unless they have a Sabbath plan. Wow. Um, so there's a whole lot more that happens by keeping the Sabbath. I'm not saying it's going to fix every problem, mm-hmm. but it sure makes a lot of them easier. And I remember as a kid, I mean, you're a kid, life is easier, but I remember life in general being easier because my family kept a Sabbath. My heart goes out to this generation, some of them who go 24-7, literally, who are yeah. who are returning texts at three in the morning uh, yeah. and who've, who've never, never known that. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Like, how has technology and social media affected our ability to Sabbath? Well, I think it's invited the world inside our house and our pocket. And um, I'm not, because probably because I'm older, I'm not as uh, attracted or addicted to um, uh, the technology as um, perhaps younger people are. But I, but I, in talking to lots of younger folks, um, I hear that uh, they develop the discipline of simply turning the phone off for the day, mm, of yes, closing yes. the computer of having a um, automatic return even on emails. Uh, I am Sabbathing today. I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow. Yeah, it can be hard, but it's so good because at least for me, being on a device is not restful at all. So, yeah. Yeah, so a yeah. screenless Sunday, I think, is, um, uh, you know, and, and for me, I was raised in the television generation. <clears throat> mm-hmm. 
and I find that if I there's a television in the room that I start watching something, a commercial comes on, I start flipping through, I'll get involved in something else. I can waste hours and not even watch a single show, you know, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that meant TV had to go when I became a Christian. Oh, you know, Jesus yeah. said, pluck your eye out if it's, if it's keeping you. Um, and so my version of plucking the eye out was to get rid of television. And yeah. so I understand, you know, through that experience that, uh, you know, having a, a, a phone or a computer can really be the thing that's keeping people from seeing the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. What are some ways if practicing Sabbath is new for us, or if we want to make our practice a little bit deeper and more robust, what are some ways that we can do that? And if you guys have resources um, that help with that, feel free to mention them as well. Sure. Um, there's the book 24 six. Yes. Uh, if somebody can afford it, um, they could contact me uh, at our ministry, uh, blessedearth.org. Okay, and we'll link, okay, we'll link to your ministry and to your book in the show notes too, just so you know, and so our listeners know too. Okay, so can't afford it, can, you know, drop me a line, I'll get you one. Um, and, I, you know, I think you need to read about this. I think you need to discuss it with other people. Uh, I think that for most doing it, with um, a partner or your small group is going to be more effective than than simply trying it yourself. I think you want to pick your time right to begin it. I was in a college um, teaching and we were talking about Sabbath. <clears throat> a young woman uh, explained that she her whole goal was she wanted to go to medical school. Uh, she mm -hmm. came to college and um, she did not do well her first year. And she just kind of saw all her dreams evaporating in front of her. Um, but she picked her time right. She read about Sabbath and everything. She started keeping it um, in the summertime, a whole lot easier to do than, mm -hmm. you know, mid semester <laughs> yes. or whatever. Yes. Um, Hard to start a new habit then. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a follow up from this, because I actually know the professor who was in that class, uh, uh, still Grace Miller, follow up is that person is in med school now. Um, oh, awesome. And and so, uh, you know, pick your time right. Um, and we have resources on uh, the two websites would be blessedearth.org and mm -hmm. follow the Sabbath uh, advice there or sabbathliving.org. We will definitely link those out. How do you know what to do on the Sabbath? Because to me, sometimes I think of the Sabbath as a day of doing nothing and resting, which is good, but also the idea of doing nothing makes me kind of anxious. So how do we know what to do on Sunday or the Sabbath day? G great question. Well, I think the point is not to work. And, and then okay. the question becomes, well, what is work? Exactly. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I use the example that if we were to uh, beam somebody from that group with Moses coming out of slavery in Egypt, and we were to beam them to 21st century America, and we were to beam them into an office building on and say Monday morning, you know, this is work. And there's somebody sitting there in an ergonomic chair. There's an air conditioning <laughs> vent over them. They've got a cup of coffee there. And here comes the work. They depress keys on a little keyboard through a quarter of an inch of non-resistance. And we'd say, that's work. And then we said, let's go see somebody having fun. And they went, uh, when we took them to a, a 5K fun run that's taking place in 90 degrees and, <laughs> and, and say, yes. those people are having fun. They're, they're not working. Uh, that, that slave from uh, ancient Egypt would say, give me some work. <laughs> give me, you know, let me press those keys. Um, <laughs> and so, right. so yeah, yeah, the definition of work has changed for many of us who are sedate six days out of the week, uh, a run is just the right thing, or a walk, or a bike ride, or a gardening um, are, are just the things to do to rest. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, a, a guy or a gal doing physical, you know, labor six days a week, um, sitting in the recliner and, you know, uh, studying the back of your eyelids is, is might be the kind of rest. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So the definition of rest and work has changed. The definition of commerce has not. Mm. And as I look at scripture and look at the intent and everything, it's really commerce that, that I think we should avoid getting and spending Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And even before reading your book, I kind of realized the commerce part in my own life, because I had, um, not that you have to keep a Sabbath, like you said, but I went from my family, um, strict isn't the right word, but we very much kept the Sabbath to being an adult when I was making my own decisions. And I was like, well, my church is in Lexington, especially during the Christmas season, I will stop and pick up whatever on my way home from church. And what I found is those few weeks before Christmas, I was just more, I mean, I wasn't doing a lot of things. I don't mean that we had a lot of like Christmas events, but I just found myself so exhausted and the going and the getting and spending had just become a habit. And I was like, I have got to quit doing this. It is wearing me out. So I can definitely agree with that. You know, I, um, I think that it, everybody needs this. And I'll give you an example of a group. One of my favorite places that I get to preach in Kentucky. And I don't get to preach in my own home state as much as I'd like to. I, Uh uh, you know, generally traveling all over. Um, But is in uh, Little Sandy uh, prison. It's a maximum security prison. I I love going there and talking. And I remember going and talking about Sabbath. Now, Uh you would think not maybe not much interest, but those uh, men uh, were so hungry to hear about it and to share their experiences um, about keeping Sabbath, the ones that did. And so even in a prison, in a maximum security prison, um, people need Sabbath and they can and they can keep it and mm-hmm. they can connect with God. Dr. Slate, I've really enjoyed, I've just really enjoyed reading your book 24-6. I know you've written other books and we'll link those out as well in the show notes, but do you have anything new in the works? I do. Thanks for asking. I am just finishing a book, which is a very heavy subject, uh, which is about suicide. Um, Mm. We live uh, in a time where the suicide rates just go up and up and up. Um, it was uh, something I was been interested in in my medical career. Um, uh, a, a, a lot of mental health is done and screened and taken care of in the emergency department. And I really wanted to know, what does the Bible have to say about this? Um, I have yet to find anybody who's ever had a sermon on suicide. Mm-hmm. Uh, people will get an after the fact talk. <laughs> Yeah. Um, after somebody perhaps in the in the congregation has committed s- suicide, um, people might hear what I would call a comfort sermon, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, suicide is something we got to get out ahead of. The only acceptable treatment uh, for suicide is prevention, and um, the church needs to articulate um, a a a stand of life here, um, that Christ did not die so that we would kill ourselves. Um, he died so that we, we would have life. And, uh, so that's what I'm working on. Um, it'll be mm-hmm. published with Tyndale. Okay. Do you know when we can expect that to come out? I don't know the exact answer to that, uh, okay. probably in the next uh, nine months or so. I am okay. just finishing the last chapter now. All right. Well, when it does, we'll definitely be looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I have one last question before we wrap it up. Um, Because the show is called the Thrive with Asbury Seminary podcast, what is one practice that can be spiritual or otherwise that is helping you thrive in your life right now? When the coronavirus started, um, I said, Uh, to my wife, Nancy, uh, let's go on a walk and let's talk about this. And I said, you know, um, we can, we can either plan to grow in this time or we can simply react to it. One of the things um, we did was to to decide uh, some of the books that we would read out loud to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, right at the moment, she's reading Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis to me. And for me, um, having a book read to me and then being able to discuss it is just something I I really treasure. And um, that's helping me grow, I think, at the moment. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. So, Dr. Sleeth, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation today. It's really made me think about Sabbath in new ways, and I just appreciate you taking the time to discuss it with me and the gift of getting to share that with our listeners. Well, thank you so much for having me, and uh, Shabbat Shalom uh, to all your listeners. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for joining me for today's conversation with Dr. Matthew Sleep. If you haven't already, I hope you'll be sure to grab a copy of his book, 24-6. I really enjoyed it, and I can say it's definitely worth the read. And I really appreciate Dr. Sleeth's time and coming on the podcast to discuss the practice of Sabbath with us today. And I hope that by listening to the conversation, we can all learn to remember the Sabbath in new ways. As always, you can follow us in all the places on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at at Asbury Seminary. Until next time, have a great day, y'all, and go do something that helps you thrive.